Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're hailing from. Welcome to another episode of Public Sector On Air here on OpenShift.tv. I am Chris Short. Uh, what is my job title these days? Ah, Principal Technical Marketing Manager at Red Hat. I am also a CNCF Ambassador, and today is the day zero of KubeCon, hence the t-shirt. I uh, love your local uh, Kubernetes meetup. Today, I'm joined by the one and only Jason Rittenauer from our public sector team. Jason, please introduce yourself to the audience. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, yeah, as you said, I'm a cloud domain architect here in public sector. Um, I specialize with emerging tech, in particular infrastructure and automation, and then automating infrastructure and infrastructureizing automation. So I touch all the virtualization stuff and some Ansible here and there and uh, basically nice. figure out how to make it work for our customers. That's awesome. Yeah, that's 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 pretty much why we're here, right? Like we, we realize that our customers have a need that is very different nowadays with COVID. So we want to make sure that we are delivering them an experience that is accessible to them. So you're going to talk about some virtualization today, which I is am. awesome because I love me some virtualization, but you're going to talk about doing it on OpenShift, which that's makes it even better. That's right. And you know, we, I say that containers and virtualization, they're basically like peanut butter and jelly. They belong together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, today I'm going to talk about uh, how that relates specifically to public sector customers. You know, I've had a lot of questions, especially since the most recent summit where we had a, a big presence with OpenShift virtualization. Uh, a lot of interest from the public sector space, particularly state and local and education. So I kind of want to address some of the questions I've heard frequently and, uh, and talk through specific use cases for OpenShift virtualization in public sector spaces? Let's do it. I mean, the, the public sector spaces have some significant, like, interesting needs, right? So there's the, the, the security side, the compliance side, the governance side, like, there's so much to it. So getting arms around it with OpenShift virtualization is going to be an interesting, interesting take here. So, yes, please enlighten All right, us. So can yeah, so I can definitely see your you screen. See, Absolutely. Yeah. Can't see my screen. Good. All right. So yeah, again, you see my name again, my title, my public sector. So let's go ahead and go forward here. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the, the big thing is um, we are looking at virtual machines and containers being managed in the same data plane, in the same control plane. And it's, it's, it's convergence now. Um, you know, of course, virtual machines have been around uh, for decades. They've been a big part of modern IT infrastructure for more than 10 years at this point. Containers have also been around forever, but we're in this renaissance now with, uh, with the advent of the Docker project and, and the other offshoot projects from that, mm -hmm. with Kubernetes making it easier to orchestrate them at scale. Uh, so what we're seeing is now we're, we're, we're looking at the next generation of containerization. Um, and, you know, really in the early days of this, this renaissance, as I referred to it, a lot of, of people and us included, were trying to manage containers like a, a subset of virtualization. We were treating the containers like smaller footprints, uh, short-lived virtual machines. And we found out early on uh, that didn't quite work. Uh, there, containers have a lot of nuances that, that don't really, aren't really the same in like a virtual environment. So, you know, we kind of went back to the drawing board early on and looked at the way we were, were managing and orchestrating containers. And a lot of what we learned, you know, of course, fed into the Kubernetes project um, and other people were reusing it today. That's the great thing about open source. Everybody benefits when we all contribute. But what we realized in back about 2016, we thought, you know, maybe instead of trying to manage containers like small virtual machines, why don't we try to manage virtual machines like long live high profile containers? So that's where really where the Kubert project began. We started looking at ways we could get virtual machines running in Kubernetes in a native way that complied with the Kubernetes API that made it easy to fit into like CD, CI CD pipelines and, and modern DevOps uh, architecture. But at the end of the day, it's really about running applications, right? So, you know, a lot of our customers are, are looking to go to more of a container native slash cloud native architecture where their applications are ready to, to be containerized and, and they are microservice friendly and they can scale up easily. But then we have a lot of customers that have legacy uh, applications and other things that rely on virtual machines, but they still want them to come into OpenShift. They want to be able to benefit from the easy way to, to, to get uh, those applications deployed in various uh, providers. Um, they're not tied to like a specific architecture or infrastructure. 
and where they can get traffic into them easily. So, you know, one of the nice things about OpenShift virtualization is we can containerize applications at a pace that works for all of us. Uh, I had an image here that's not showing up for some reason. Um, huh. And that makes me mad because it was going to be, is a, have you ever seen that? Is it a GIF or something? Is it like animated or? It, it, it's not animated, but it's still not showing up. Oh. Uh, I was, what it was going to be, so you know that Futurama episode where it's the global warming and they talk about how they throw an ice cube into the, the ocean to solve the problem of global warming once and for all. Right. So yeah. what we can do is we can bring virtual machines into OpenShift to solve the problem of containerization once and for all, right? Right. But yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> the thing is, that is, so yeah, you, you might have things that are virtual machines today and they are legacy and they are monolithic applications and they can't be broken down into containers easily without a lot of rework. But maybe you want them to run in OpenShift for some reason. So what we can do is we can take them today, bring them into OpenShift as full virtual machines without changing anything to the underlying architecture of that, that application. And then you can just get them running in OpenShift and then you can rework them at your own pace. And you know, some yep. things are going to be easier, an easier lift to, uh, to make microservice friendly. And some things might take months, years, never. Regardless yeah. of what, what your pace is, we can do it with OpenShift virtualization. Um, and you know, maybe you have applications that rely on like vendor uh, virtual appliances and that sort of thing. Or maybe some Windows-based apps that depend on like a full-blown older version of SQL or, or maybe like a Microsoft uh, file server of some type. Yep. That can also be containerized as well. So you can have an entire architecture that's maybe a hybrid application where it's part containers, part virtual machines. Regardless of what it is, it can easily come into OpenShift through our, our import process. Oh, there we go. There's there the, it is. Uh, there we go. There's yeah. the, yep. so okay. I kind of spoiled it, but yeah, we're going to solve this problem of getting applications from a legacy architecture into OpenShift once and for all. Mm. So here's what's going on under the hood. Um, you know, you might say, well, you already have Red Hat virtualization, you have OpenStack, why do you want to, to reinvent the wheel and, and do it another way? The thing is, OpenShift virtualization relies on that same underlying uh, hypervisor layer that OpenStack and Red Hat virtualization both utilize. It's all libvirt, it's KVM, it's QEMU, except it's containerized. Um, so this makes it easy to kind of port workloads from one of those platforms into OpenShift virtualization. And it's all the same underlying mechanisms underneath. So if you have an ATO today for Red Hat virtualization or OpenStack, it's probably not going to be that big of a lift to get one for OpenShift virtualization. It's all the same processes underneath. And yep. what we're doing here is basically we're just, we're launching a Lurvert daemon in a container uh, through this vert handler process. So it makes it really easy to, uh, to deploy your virtual machines on OpenShift um, using the, the same architecture we're using in our other products. Uh, of course, it all wraps into the Kubernetes API so we can utilize it through, uh, through the OC command or kubectl. Uh, there's also a separate offshoot called vertcuttle to do some of the virtual machine specific uh, functions like get access to consoles and that kind of thing. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wish this technology existed, uh, what, three years ago when I was working for a financial services marketing company and we were moving a 10-year-old .NET app oh, God. Uh, and modernizing it and doing all this stuff. And man, I mean, we wanted to use containers. We had to use virtual machines. We had, you know, Windows, like 2008 servers that we just could not, like, break for a while. And it was like, right. we know we're going to break this at some point. We just don't know when and we need to move these things now. Um, and if we could have just lifted and shifted them into a, yeah. a platform like OpenShift, boy, that would have saved us a ton of headache. Yeah, it's funny you should mention that. One of my few non-public sector engagements over my, my time at Red Hat was uh, back in the early OpenShift 3.x days. It might have been 3.1 or 3.2. Nice. It was a customer in Telco. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I can name them, and I probably don't want to because I might shame Please them by doing so. No, no, no. Uh, Please don't. <laughs> but uh, they also had a legacy application. It was uh, WebSphere. And it was, it had been basically, um, I don't want to say abandoned, but all the people who originally created it were long gone from the company. So nobody knew how it actually worked. Yeah. Um, the only way we were able to figure out anything was by actually looking at like patent applications about this app. So wow, we managed, yeah, we managed to get that thing ported opening on OpenShift in a container, but it was like a 20 gig or so image because we just, we had to bring so much along with so it because we didn't know how to, how to break it up. Yeah. So 
you know, again, if that application, if we would have had this tech back then, it would have made that a lot easier. Yeah. And it's, you, you pointed out the exact right thing, right? Like it's it, your AT. No, don't have to worry about that. It's single pane of glass. It's the same platform. It's the same system. You don't have to change anything. You just update the latest version and mm -hmm. you have this capability actually in four five, you have this capability, not just latest version, just to be specific, but yeah, like this is there ready to go. Yes, it is. And since it's all operator based, and I know we've done a few sessions on operators here on OpenShift TV, it's easy to deploy. Um, it manages the life cycle. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really easy to get started. Awesome. Now, I did mention Red Hat virtualization. You uh, we're going we're gonna to see kind of a convergence, I think, between Red Hat virtualization and OpenShift and the, the um, you know, Red Hat virtualization is, of course, a legacy virtualization uh, architecture. Mm -hmm. it's, we, I don't want to say we're supporting it till 2026. It's not like it's going away tomorrow. So let's exactly. just be clear about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But I mean, we know that we believe, again, at Red Hat, the future is containers. We believe that the future of virtualization is container native virtualization or OpenShift virtualization as we're calling it now. So why not have a path to go forward and to evolve Red Hat virtualization? It's not definitely, it's, it's, it's got a future. It's just going to evolve into container native virtualization. So right. today with the most recent release of Red Hat virtualization, you can actually reach out to an OpenShift virtualization cluster as an external provider and manage the virtual machines running on that OpenShift virtualization cluster today. Um, you know, you can do your basic start stop functions. You can get console access. Um, you can do some other like day two operations on them through your existing Red Hat tooling today, uh, Red Hat virtualization tooling. Mm -hmm. It also cuts the other way because we can actually import virtual machines from Red Hat virtualization and VMware today uh, through OpenShift virtualization. So if you have a legacy uh, infrastructure, virtualization infrastructure, we have got tooling for you to get those virtual machines out of that virtual or that legacy architecture and into OpenShift virtualization and make them container native. Now, today we can only do a single virtual machine at a time, but we do have tooling coming later this year they will allow you to do a bulk migrations of massive uh, virtual machine workloads uh, through a procedural uh, system. Yeah, I mean, it, this is just the evolution of container native virtualization, essentially, right? Like the, exactly. tooling, the, the foundation has been laid and now the tooling is coming in on top to make migrations and, you know, lift and shift a little bit easier. Right, and, and you know, you, you made a good point. This is the foundation. Uh, this is the first generally available release. I guess I can actually say today that uh, yeah. it was made available at Kube, uh, gen the GA announcement was made at KubeCon today. Yes. So, you know, it's out there. OpenShift virtualization is there for existing OpenShift customers. You can, again, deploy it through the uh, the operator marketplace. And uh, the, the current version of open virtualization is, is uh, 2.4. So that is our first generally available release. It is supported. So, you know, if you're using it today, if you file yeah. a support case, you'll get uh, your your normal uh, SLA with your your various levels of support. Also, congratulations on uh, beating my uh, cohort, Andrew Sullivan, on the channel after the GA of uh, OpenShift virtualization. Good job. Nice work. Yeah, I, just, I, I was what I was <laughs> excited to see that, uh, that I was going to be presenting today. I'm like, all right, it's GA day. Woohoo. I get to be the first, nice. the first one to kind of honk that horn. So, yeah, good stuff. Awesome. So, you know, our government agencies, um, public sector, we, we kind of tend to maybe get sometimes treated with the same broad brush. And there are so many different agency types in public sector. Um, and they've all got different needs and different wants and desires. And, you know, like, for example, security to a DOD customer is different for, than security to like a civilian agency. Oh, yeah. So regardless of, of what specific subset of public sector they are, they're all trying to modernize applications just the same as everybody in commercial is. So we're working with them to help them bring these modern applications. You know, these two examples I got here on the slide are, are examples of, uh, of partners working with public sector, but you know, like the military has been in through the Defense Innovation Unit working with us in the OpenShift uh, Innovation Labs to mm -hmm. get their applications containerized and, and cloud native and cloud friendly. Uh, Lockheed Martin is another good partner for us. So. What we want to do in the public sector space is we want to help these customers find ways to get their applications into production in the fastest possible way using our technology. So 
this brings up some of the concerns I've seen from public sector customers, some of the, the frequently asked questions I, I had. Yep. And I'm going to hit these through a combination of presentation, uh, back and forth Q&A with you, Chris, demo, uh, who knows, maybe even some interpretive dance if, if we get to that. Yeah, but, we might uh, have to. But yeah, so let's let's hit on some of these concerns I've, I've heard from the public sector uh, space. So, you know, as I said, we did go GA today, the official announcement at least, it's actually been released a, a couple weeks back, but it's officially OpenShift virtualization is here today, ready for your, your workloads. And I've heard some customers say, well, this is new emerging tech. Is this really production ready? Can I actually run production workloads on this today? And I'm here to say, yes, you can. Um, now, again, it is emerging tech. So some of the features you would you have gotten used to from like Red Hat virtualization or VMware aren't in the product as of yet today. But you can spin up virtual machines. You can migrate them back and forth. You can uh, you know access storage, networking, all that good stuff. And we have a very aggressive roadmap with OpenShift virtualization. It's going to release at a three-month cadence, the same as OpenShift is. So you know, just looking at the, at the stuff I see on the red map, roadmap today, I'm very excited. It's going to rapidly mature, and it's going to be a matter of time before not only does it catch up with where Red Hat virtualization is today, but it's going to eclipse it and go forward because it is container native, because it's Kubernetes native. It's going to open up new possibilities that just don't exist with the legacy virtualization infrastructure today. Yeah, there's there's a lot of opportunity with the container native platforms and Kubernetes native function or not functions, but Kubernetes native way of doing things. When you start layering in VMs on top of that, it gets pretty cool. Yep. And again, we've been working on this for a few years now. Uh, yeah. We actually started the Kubert project back in 2016, and you know we've we have a couple customers today that actually are running on production on upstream versions of the OpenShift virtualization stack since. You know, we didn't have a G8 until recently, but they've got production workloads and, you know, they're having great success with it. So, uh, you know, I think in time, as, as the platform evolves, we'll be able to, to take more, more and more use cases mm -hmm. and bring them into OpenShift virtualization to where it's, it's really going to be a matter of time to where, uh, you know, most everything that's not a container is going to run on, on a OpenShift uh, native uh, application architecture. It's a platform, right? Like we want you to put your workloads here. And we want you to be able to put your workloads anywhere at that point, right? Like that's the beauty of OpenShift. Exactly. I mean, it's it, like you said, it's a platform. It's not just for developers. We're ready for the operations team to come in and, and bring their stuff into OpenShift and, uh, and see the, the joy that is Kubernetes and how much simpler it can make your life. Exactly. Can't wait. All right. So Does it work thing. in fifths mode? Yeah, exactly. Yes. You know, that's that's another thing I've heard a lot. Of course, FIPS is important to our public sector customers for sure. Um, and we do have the ability to enable FIPS-based cryptography uh, starting, I think, with OpenShift 4.3 was the first yes. version that we supported that. Um, that story is constantly evolving. I know it's coming soon to OpenShift container storage. So again, watch this space for, for more information about that. But, you know, I've actually had an essay ask me a couple of weeks back. It's like, well, does OpenShift virtualization support FIPS? And I thought... You know, I haven't seen anything about that, so I want to try that myself. <laughs> so the environment I am going to demo in today is does have FIPS enabled. Nice. Um, we do have, uh, I have etcd encryption on the back end, all that kind of stuff, and it works fine. Now, the reason I have an asterisk here is because I did specifically put out an ask to the product team to say, do we support this? Because I, I, I like to say works and supported are two different things. That's very true, right? Like, yes, OpenShift is FIPS compliant in a certain way. Uh, OpenShift virtualization is FIPS compliant in a certain way. Uh, but do we support working under that FIPS compliant in OpenShift virtualization? That is kind of a yes or no question yeah. at this point. We don't know yet. Yeah. So I do have, I'm waiting on feedback from a member of the product team. Uh, I would so imagine that, the answer is yes, but I, yeah. I think it's going to be, but yeah, I just, I want to see an official statement somewhere that yes, we support FIPS mode and OpenShift virtualization. Until I see that, I'm still going to put that asterisk, but Makes you know, in my, me, me putting it through the pace, I haven't seen any problems. So uh, good stuff so far. So if you got, yeah. if you're ready for FIPS, we're ready for you. Uh, question in chat is, can we run Windows VMs now? Yes. Yes, we can. I'm going to get to that in a little bit as well. But OpenShift virtualization is actually past Microsoft's Windows Server virtualization validation program. Try saying that five times fast. Um, 
It is supported going back as far as Windows 2012 R2 is the oldest version of Windows we support. Okay. Um, again, older versions of that may work, but are not supported. So, right. but again, that's that's going to help a lot because I know that, um, you know, Windows containers are also tech preview now in OpenShift. Yes. And if you got something that supports like, you know, .NET, the most recent versions of .NET or the most recent versions of SQL, mm -hmm. that'll probably containerize easy, but some of these older versions of SQL or .NET, probably not so much. So right. we can just bring those window, legacy Windows VMs in and present them through OpenShift as, as just another uh, containerized uh, .NET or, or SQL environment or what have you. It, it can. Uh, so I haven't tested this on Windows VM. Does it do graceful shutdowns? And yeah, okay, so good. Yeah. Okay, and then right. Yeah, if you do stop virtual machine, it'll do an actual. Shut down. Shut down. Proper shutdown. Okay, cool. Correct. Um, and do we support cloning of Windows VMs right now? I don't think so. Um, I but believe it, it's so. like it. I mean, it's it's like copy paste YAML basically still, right? Like so. I mean, it's there, so there is actually a clone mechanism, but I haven't tried it on a Windows VM. I'd have to validate yeah. that. I would yeah. cautiously say yes. As um, would I, right? Like I would <laughs> assume yes, but I yeah. don't no for certain so yeah uh right I'll, we'll check in on that one yeah I'll, I'll check on that and i'll follow up with you but yeah I, I would think the answer is yes but again i'll, I'll put yes with an asterisk there you so, go yeah that's gonna be my go-to if i can't say for sure okay cool <laughs> so the other thing public sector customers are always asking the, about this is why we have the show <laughs> disconnected install um, you know, this is especially big in the DOD space. They want everything to be able to deploy without any active connection to the internet. Um, Manufacturing you know, the same to, way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I've had to do many POCs over the years with various Red Hat products where, you know, I go into a totally air gapped environment. I don't, I, you know, it's the type of places where you have to like leave your cell phone at the, in, a, in a locker and you have to go into a Faraday cage and you've got no connectivity to the outside world. You can get hit by a nuclear bomb and not know until you walk out at the end of the day. Right. But getting Red Hat bits into those environments can be a challenge. And you know, some operators are better than others about uh, installing in a disconnected environment. So I will say OpenShift virtualization does support disconnected install. Again, I haven't tested a fully air-gapped environment because COVID, I haven't been going to those kind of places, but um, from what I've seen, based on how it's handling the, the image pulling process and, and getting it uh, distributed to the, uh, the disconnected environment, it looks like it shouldn't be an issue in an air gap environment. So again, that's yeah, there. That's super supported. important for our, um, for our folks out there that are in uh, protected environments, we'll just call it. Yeah. Definitely. So the other, another big thing, of course, is network security. Um, I've got to say, I think OpenShift network policies are probably some of the most fine-grained security controls I've seen out of the box for networking, at least in any Red Hat product. Mm. Uh, of course, the older versions of OpenShift utilized, um, you know, multi-tenancy, as, as it's called today, where basically everything in one project could only talk to things in, in its own project unless it was explicitly enabled to talk to another project. Today, the default is everything uses this network policy isolation mode where Things can talk to each other in, in from project to project, but you can easily set it so that, again, only things in the same project can talk to each other. Only certain pods with the same label can talk to each other. Only certain ports are allowed to uh, be accessed from a particular pod or virtual machine. So this makes uh, that east-west traffic control really easy. And we'll, we'll hit on some of this when we, we demo it later, but um, yeah. I think it's a pretty complete solution. Yeah, keep in mind, folks, that it's like your container is now a pod. Like it's treated as a as a Kubernetes native asset, so you can apply all kinds of policy. You can go full OPA on it if you want. Open policy agent with Rego and everything, right? Like you can go nuts with your policy regul and regulatory requirements here. I mean, and yes, you're absolutely right. Our east west like granularity is insane. So yes, love it very much. Mm -hmm. Now another thing we have in. Uh in OpenShift virtualization is we have the concept of routes for handling HTTP and HTTPS traffic. If, and we expose those to services and then you can access that through a, uh, like a fully qualified domain name, which we refer to as a route. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're doing non-HTTP or HTTPS traffic, then you have to think about that a little bit differently. 
Um, the preferred way to do it today, if you're using the pod native networking that we've, we've just been discussing, would be to expose your virtual machine through what we call a node port. So we're, we're, what we're basically going to do is we're going to open up a port on that, that your node, your virtual machine is running on, and we're going to map that back to the, the port that's handling traffic on that virtual machine. In this example, um, you can see a node port that's going to talk to the remote desktop de uh, protocol on a Windows virtual machine. So you can get access to like the RDP, the console through RDP that way. Um, you can use that to get like SSH access to a Linux virtual machine that way. There are of course other ways around this, other like um, modes of ingress, but this is just based on what's in the box today, what's the, the default OpenShift configuration, how you would go about accessing some of those non uh, HTTP and HTTPS services uh, through container native virtualization. And then another thing we can do is we have the concept of, uh, of multiple interface networking using Multis, where you can actually attach a, a virtual machine directly to your physical network. So again, this allows you to get traffic that, that isn't HTTP or HTTPS into your virtual machines. If you need to like pixie boot a virtual machine for some reason and, and you know, build off a, off a pixie server or whatnot, this is how you would go about doing that. Now the caveat here is that OpenShift uh, network policies don't apply to these like bridged interfaces. Mm -hmm. So to that end, you'd either have to run like a um, like a host-based firewall on the virtual machine itself, or handle security and and, and traffic uh, through rules on your your external uh, firewalls or, or whatnot. But uh, yeah, it, it really opens up the possibilities what you can do as far as traffic handling within the virtual machine. Oh yeah, Maltus is a pretty nifty tool. And, and as far as just being able to bridge all the different networks that you could possibly want, right? Like Maltus is it. Definitely. Uh, very cool technology. And again, this this is a very much evolving story. Um, we're going to see a lot of a lot of innovation happen with this. I can just, I can see. I mean, just the like, CNI space is exploding already. Oh, so definitely. yeah. <laughs> and another thing to, to point out as well, there's also a lot of other... Um, like partner and even Red Hat supplied stuff on the marketplace today that can can extend the functionality of your networking and increase you know do different things with security and that kind of thing like um, of course Red Hat Service Mesh is one possibility. Uh, there's New Vector. There's a Twist Lock. So definitely um, you know if you're using any of those technologies today, they can also integrate with the the OpenShift uh, virtualization. Again, like Chris said, it's all pod networking at, at the end of the day, at least with the default interface. So, yeah, um, it's, Kuber it's Kubernetes native. You can yep. do what you got to do with whatever Kubernetes tool you want. <laughs> Indeed. Now, as far as day two operations on the virtual machines, I'm very happy to say that, you know, Satellite and Ansible are still going to be the heroes here. Um, we got, I got a couple articles here with some, uh, some bit.ly URLs so you can get to them easier. But we do have a, Kubert satellite provider that allows you to provision virtual machines using satellite. Um, that is still tech preview, I think. I'm not sure that it's considered GA now since uh, OpenShift virtualization is GA or if it's going to have to wait on another uh, satellite major release to be considered GA, but it's out there and it works. There's also a, a plethora of Kubert Ansible modules that, again, uh, they've been around for a while. Uh, the one I'm linking to here is actually the Kubert VM module, but there are plenty of others. There's one for disks, one for hand handling networking, uh, that sort of thing. Ansible can also utilize OpenShift virtualization or Kubert as an inventory source. Uh, so again, we can pull in your virtual machines and get figure out how to access them using that. And then finally, I got an article here to link to using a jump post to get nice. access to an environment that, that Ansible maybe can't talk to directly. We use that a lot in like, in mm -hmm. OpenStack or you know public cloud providers where they don't have not everything has like a public interface or right. a public uh, floating IP or whatnot. Yep. So this way we can use that as like a bastion host to get in and talk to uh, to virtual machines that aren't exposed on the public network. So lots of different ways to do your day two operations. This is going to be great for handling like security profiles on your virtual machines. Again, both satellite can do that through its Open SCAP integration. Uh, Ansible can certainly apply a Stig profile. So. Mm -hmm. Whatever way you prefer to manage your virtual machines, it's really not going to be that drastically different with OpenShift virtualization. It's just a matter of maybe tweaking how you're accessing them directly a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I use jump host for the Ansible all the time, right? Like it's totally normal operation for me now, I feel like. 
<laughs> yeah, it's definitely, it's good stuff and it's very flexible and versatile. So um, we'll actually do a little bit of Ansible demos. I've actually got Tower running in OpenShift. So that makes it a little easier. And that's another possibility too. You can yeah. Tower in OpenShift. So it's just using the native pod networking as well. But again, regardless of, of what way you choose to go about it, we can definitely manage it with Tower or Satellite. No yeah. problem. So some of the other questions I hit about public sector customers, of course, um, OpenShift 4 runs on Core OS, which is based on RHEL 8. And as mm -hmm. you know, we drop support for a lot of older hardware with RHEL 8. Uh, you know, things, some, there's just some of the kernel modules yep. aren't there. I hit that I've got bug this weekend. Of, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I've got a whole bunch of sad Dell R610s down in my basement that, that you know, I R820, can't, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, you know, you can certainly, you can hack around it to get those kernel modules in it and working. Yeah, um, totally you can, but yeah, yeah. it's... But again, not supported. So it makes it hard for customers that do want to just play with OpenShift virtualization and see how it runs in their environment, you know, get a, get a feeling for what managing virtual machines are like. So I'm going to present a couple of different things you can go about. And again, notice the first bullet point here. None of this is supported. This is just your, your friendly neighborhood cloud domain architect telling you if you want to play with this and do non-production stuff, this is how you can go about it. Here's to tinkers. <laughs> exactly. So of course, it does depend on hardware virtualization. Um, you can enable nested virtualization on Rev or vSphere, vSphere or OpenStack. And you know, that exposes the, uh, the VMX uh, bits and everything. And then you can actually you know, run, on, run nested on that environment. You're not gonna see too big of a, of a hit on performance that way um, because it's just passing through the CPU instructions directly yeah. uh, to the underlying host. So, that's one way of doing it. My first real exposure to OpenShift Virtual Division was running on a, on a vSphere stack. So um, it's viable to do it that way to, for testing. Um, but the thing is with that is that's not gonna work for most of your public cloud providers because they don't expose the, uh, the nested virtualization bits. So for that, you can enable um, software emulation, uh, which that is, your, you're gonna see a little bit of a performance hit that way. Um, confession, the environment I'm going to demo today is actually using software emulation because my storage in my home lab, uh, unfortunately had an issue. Mm -mm. Yeah. I, I found out the hard way that the old adage of the time you're most likely to lose a disc is during a raid rebuild. So I already had one rebuild going on and another yep. disc drop. So yep. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm up the Creek right now. Uh, Oof, but anyway, so, so again, this works, it's maybe not as performant as nested virtualization, but Again, if you're just trying to see what it looks like, get a feeling for how you manage your virtual machines, how you access them, this works. Um, and to this end, uh, we do have support coming for running OpenShift on bare metal public cloud providers. Yes. Um, that's one of the things today that kind of falls in the maybe sort of will work, but it's not supported. And the main reason for that is we just, we run with the public cloud bare metal providers we run into things like how they do the, the networking Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily jive well with how OpenShift tries to lay down its, uh, its software-defined network. So, um, but so full official support is coming later. And, yeah, uh, we're working with our partners on that right now. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Definitely think that's, uh, that's going to be something that's going to be a deep game changer because, you know, a lot of times we see our public sector customers, um, they're trying to shrink, shrink their data center footprints and they're trying to do more stuff in the public cloud. So, uh, I definitely see that that public cloud bare metal use case being something that that is going to be, especially for the sled guys. They're they're always interested in that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So with that, I'm done with my Yay! slides. So now it's time to see what we can break in a demo environment. Oh, we're gonna break some stuff. You know it. Love it. Yeah, I uh, I bought an old R820 uh, to put in my house. It's the first real server I've ever owned. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was spinning up a RAID 10 array on just the four disks that came with it, like, you know, 10,000 RPM disks. And I was like, wow. Right. Um, I might have to buy some SSDs for this thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> because uh... the IO is not too hot. Yeah. Uh, no, but... it's it's definitely not fun, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I like, on the one hand, I like having a data center in my basement. On the other hand, my wife doesn't like it. And yeah, uh, yeah. it's my R610s are actually an upgrade from the 2950 I used to have. And man, that thing, um, it was right below our living room. 
about so that we'd thing. So we'd, we'd yeah. be like watching TV at night, and all of a sudden I'd turn it on via IPMI, and you would just hear like the sounds of jet engines underneath us. And she'd just kind of look at me and roll her eyes like, oh my God, are you doing work stuff now? So <laughs> at least my R610s aren't as loud, so I, I can be a little more stealthy about it. But but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely- Yeah, noise more. rating was definitely one of the things I checked when I bought this one. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, so we are on an OpenShift environment um, in the public cloud. 4.5 for those out four there. Five. Yep. 4.5.5 to be clear. Four VMs underneath the hood there. Yeah. Four virtual machines running across a couple different namespaces. Oh. And you can see I got a healthy mix here. I got uh, some Windows, I got a Windows virtual machine, a RHEL, a CentOS, and a Fedora. Nice. Um, so we're going to get in here and, and play with these in different ways in a little bit. While we're doing that, though, I want to go ahead and give me a second to... I'm gonna, we're gonna spin up a virtual machine right now to just to show what the process looks like. So, thought I left that tab open in my browser, but I didn't. Yeah, no. No big. I, sometimes I just, I'm so smart, I forget how smart I am and I forget to do stuff. Mm. All right, so I'm gonna do new from wizard here. This allows me to basically go through a UI that I define everything, uh, you know, pretty much like you would with a legacy virtualization system. It's asking me for a source. Again, I can select Pixie. So I can, I can do a full blown Pixie install. I can point to a URL. I can pull like an image or an ISO in. I can do a container image. So we can actually take container images and mount them as disks. And then I can also do like an existing disk I've already got uploaded. So in this case, I'm gonna do URL. I'm going to drop this in. Nice. So this is gonna use the latest Zero S cloud image. Zero S, for those of you not aware or who maybe haven't seen it in OpenStack, it's a really lightweight Linux-based virtual machine. Um, and it's good for when you want something just spun up fast just to validate uh, basic functionality. So since that's not listed, I'm just gonna do a CentOS 6 or higher operating system profile. That's mostly just metadata about the virtual machine. So it's not really having much impact on functionality here. Right. You can see we can do either like t-shirt size type flavors mm -hmm. or we can specify the memory and CPU count manually. In this case, I am gonna go ahead and select tiny though. Whoops, tiny, not small. And then your workload profile. Uh, the only one I've got here is server. There's also like desktop and high performance. Right. And that that's where the, the OS dropdown matters, right? Right. So default, I'm going to use the uh, the pod networking interface. So again, this is going to mean that everything is going to utilize the native OpenShift networking. You can see I can easily add an interface though. Oh yeah. If I had different you, definitions, it would be got, right here. If you got bonds, you you can do you can go all day with anything you want. Right. Yeah. You can do a bridge. You can do SRIOV. You can specify the MAC address if you want. Again, there might be a few use cases that that you want to have that kind of control over it. But uh, yeah, it's really easy to add an interface through the wizard here. Next, we get to storage. Now, it's going to define a root disk by default here. And again, its source is going to be URL. So that means it's going to pull from that image from the uh, URL I supplied. I'm going to go in and edit it, though, and make a couple of changes. So you can see I could change the size here. So default mm -hmm. is 10, 10 gigs. Zero S doesn't need anything that big. So I'm just going to go ahead and drop it down to five. It could even be tinier. but. Uh, we can also specify the interface. So do we want to use vert IOO, or excuse me, vert IO, SATA, SCSI? And again, there might be a couple of use cases where, you know, for, for CD drives, you might want to use SATA rather than vert IO. Right. Uh, you might have some, some like a legacy system that needs to utilize SCSI rather than vert IO. So again, uh, we can be flexible with that. I am going to go ahead and leave this on vert IO though. Storage class allows us to take an existing defined storage type in OpenShift and that is the backend storage. Now, Nice. In this case, I have AWS EFS. So this is going to utilize um, Amazon's Elastic File System to dynamically create a share for me on the back end. It's one of the nice things about running this in Amazon. I mean, you know, performance aside of, of software emulation, right. I've got easy access to, to other types of storage. So again, I could do GP2. Um, if you're running on-prem, we can do like uh, OpenShift container storage. We can do NFS. We can do... Basically, any type of storage OpenShift supports can be easily exposed to a virtual machine. And then going even further, if your provider supports something like full disk encryption for a block device, it's easy to do that as well using that, uh, that built-in provisioner. Nice. Did you happen to do that with the service operator, the create the I, EFS thing, or did you do that on your own? I did not. I did that manually. Okay. That's fine. Is, I was is, just is curious. Is there a service operator for that? 
Yeah, there's a. I think there's it's it has three words in the name, but it's something something service operator, mm. right? And it's Let's designed it's know. designed to work with those external services. I don't yes. know if it would have spun it up for you too easily. I haven't kicked the tires on it yeah. with like EFS, but interesting. Um, I'll have to look into that yeah, for sure. Yeah, maybe give it a look. It might help you save some time in the future at least. Because man oh man, do I hate creating PVC claims and PVs myself. <laughs> it's so nice to have a have a, a storage class that does it for you. So anyway, I, one thing I want to point out here, note I'm making this shared access, RWX. It's very important for if you're going to want to migrate the virtual machine from node to node, it has to have the back end needs to be rewrite uh, many. Uh, mostly because you'll see as we get in here that when you do a migrate, basically it has to spawn another cube launcher pod or vert launcher pod on the virtual machine that's going to, on the node it's going to migrate to so it can hand off the storage to that other node. So it basically does have to be mounted both places at once for at least a brief few seconds. So we'll go ahead and click next here. Um, you can supply a cloud init payload if you want. So I'm gonna specify my host name. I can drop in a uh, SSH key if I want. You can do a full-blown cloud init script here if you want. So nice. um, this shows you what it looks like. You can. Again, if you're familiar with CloudNet, you can pass along all sorts of things to like configure packages. Run Ansible um, if you want. Yeah, all kinds of fun stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So virtual hardware, I don't have, I could attach a CD-ROM if you wanted. Um, one thing to point out here, when you're doing like Windows virtual machines, it's automatically going to pull the uh, vert wing IO container image and okay. mount that as a CD. So you can do so that way you'll be able to see uh, like the storage drivers to access your disks mm -hmm. because uh, by default Windows doesn't have a uh, built-in support for drivers. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's going to go my little review screen. Um, ask me to confirm everything. This all looks good. So I'm going to go ahead and click start virtual machine on creation. Create VM. And now let's go look and see what's going on on the back end. So I'm going to go over here to pods. Now. Since I am uh, supplying this as a URL, it's going to run this uh, importer CROS root disk, and it had an issue. Scratch base required and none found. That's interesting. Well, it certainly didn't do that when I was testing this. Uh, but it looks like it's going to try to spawn it again. Um, yeah. So what that's what that scratch, scratch base basically is, that is a file system space that um, allows you to pull in the, the raw image or the ISO or whatever. And it uses that to then transform that into something that OpenShift virtualization can mount. And then it goes through and also validates that the, the image is uh, you know, kosher and ready to mount more or less. So what we would see here is we would see through, okay, there we go, this worked. Okay, so cool. apparently it was just a slight race condition and it didn't, uh, yeah. didn't have that scratch space ready, but you can see it went through it uh, pulled the image in, it validated it, it converted it to raw, and then it mounted it on my vert launcher pod, which is now running. And it terminated that, uh, that uh, importer pod. So that utilizes the um, containerized data importer is what that process is called, where it pulls in your image or ISO or what have you. Mm -hmm. So we now have a running virtual machine. Just like that. Just like that. <laughs> and this is over on my zero S uh, test VM. And again, you can see it's telling us all sorts of neat information about it. It's telling us what node it's running on. It's telling us it's pod networking IP address. We'll kind of explore that in a little bit. Um, it's telling us information about the virtual machine, about the, the network interfaces, the disks, what its current uh, resource utilization looks like. And note here, again, every, like everything else that's, can, that's Kubernetes native, everything is defined as YAML. Right. So I can exactly. easily- It's all YAML, all the way yeah, down. <laughs> I can go in, I can make manual edits to this YAML if I want. I can export this out and go do some edits and then spawn another virtual machine from it if I want one that's similar. Um, so yeah, there's, you can see like things like the CPU, memory, disks, all of this are defined as YAML. So, you know, again, this, this is something that's probably going to fit into like CI CD pipelines and, and DevOps really naturally as, mm -hmm. as we start uh, exploring it more. But here's the big thing you can see we have console access. Now, this is using VNC by default. I can also switch over to like a serial console if I want for, for Linux VMs at least. Right. 
and it does do RDP for Windows VMs. It does. We'll, we'll hit that in a minute too. Yeah. But uh, I think I typed that right. No, I did not. And you can see it got my host name that I supplied there. So yay for cloud and net. Nice. And I've got now got a, a prompt here. So basic Linux instance, nothing uh, too exciting, but uh, so yeah, that, that's how you would create a, a basic virtual machine. Um, and of course it can do a lot more than, than just CRS. We can do several different versions of Windows, several different versions of Linux are supported. Um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, of course, being the, the, the way we want you to go, but we can also do Fedora, CentOS, even Ubuntu uh, 1804 long-term support. So we're, we're opinionated, but we're not biased. So if you want to run a non-rel OS here, we're, we're certainly okay with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next question is, you know, how do we get access to these virtual machines from the outside world? How do we SSH into a Linux VM? How do we um, SSA or get RDP access, like you said? Mm -hmm. So we'll go over here to another project I've got. Let's go to Vert Demo 2. I've got a couple of existing virtual machines running. I got a Fedora 32 and a CentOS 7. Nice. And again, you can see it tells us what node it's running on and what its IP address is. Now, those are, of course, pod networking IP addresses, so they're not accessible from outside the OpenShift cluster. Right. So the challenge with that is I want to get access to that, and I want to be able to do it from my, my workstation on the, the regular office network, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want to have to jump into the, the no. web interface every time I need to touch a VM. So this is where... So, well, and honestly, you know, the, the console is VNC based. It's, it works, but it's not something I'd want to manage virtual machines through all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's good if you just want to do some basic troubleshooting, but, but yeah, I'd rather have SSH shell access myself. So you can see we can utilize services here. Um, I've got a couple services defined for SSHing into both my CentOS and my Fedora VM. And what this is doing is this is creating a, a cluster IP address that I can then access in this case through a node port. So you might be saying, well, how does that work? I'm gonna go here to my, my terminal window. And again, I'm doing this through Windows because I want, I want everybody to see that you don't need to be a Linux whiz to know how to do this. Right. Um, the OC binary, the vert C, uh, cuddle binary, they're available for Windows, Mac, what have you. So um, yep, I'm gonna do that. And go and can be cross compiled. It's yep. great, good stuff. So if I type OC get BMI, I'm going to go ahead and do all namespaces too. So this will show me all my virtual machines running across all my, my projects within OpenShift. So you can see my Fedora 32 uh, VM is running on this node right here. So I'm going to SSH in, SSH, not DDH. I don't know what that's going to do. Well, you never know. You never know. It might <laughs> do something. Just duplicate help? No? Okay. I would have no idea what that would do in Windows. <laughs> so let's see. Actually, I got a little bit ahead of myself. Let me cancel out of that because I need to see the port. OC get service. And let's invert demo two. Okay. So my uh, Fedora SSH port is using 30, 50, 354. So let's see here, SSH as user Fedora to that node. You ever have one of those days where your yeah, fingers just yeah. don't want to do what you're telling them to do? No, that's, that's quite frequent for me. <laughs> It is not fun at all no. when that happens. Are you on a Mac keyboard or something? I am. Or some weird so that, keyboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That really throws it off. <laughs> all right. So now port 30, 354. You can do it. I believe in you. I can do it. <laughs> so again, I already had my public key um, copied to this virtual machine. So I was able to do that without supplying a password because I've got a public key on this host. Uh, so yeah, I'm logged into my Fedora virtual machine now. Um, and basically it's the same as any other uh, shell instance. You know, I can do LS, I can validate that my uh, HTTP server is running. Yeah. And 
because I've got that HTTP service running, that is normal HTTP traffic. So I can hit that through a route that I've got exposed here. So hello. there's my hello world. Nice. So, you know, just to show there's no uh, funny business here, I'll validate that that is in fact the same one. You could actually drop that link into uh, like the, the Twitch chat if you wanted, or just send it to me and it's actually public to everybody. You know? I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> but I can't do it if I'm not logged in as the root user, so. Now well, permissions matter. Yeah, they do. <laughs> Stupid secure by default. Right. Why can't everything just be chmod c seventy seven seven four? All right, so now if I go in and refresh that, there you go. Hello, Chris. Hey, look at that. That's so awesome. I'll drop that into the chat so that if anybody else wants to see it. Grab that up. Oh, come on. You can do it. Copy. I think, yeah. I think my, yeah, we go. All right. Question is, which chat are you dropping it in? Chris Short privately. Okay, that works. You see it? Nope. Nope. <laughs> All right, well, let me do this other one then. There, there's two Chris Shorts and that's messing me up. How many of you people are there? I, just enough. Just enough of them. You could share it with everyone. There's only, it's just us here. <laughs> but yeah. Copy. Paste. There you go. So, you oh, know, yeah. that's how we would go about getting traffic into a virtual machine from the outside world. Again, if you're running, you know, HTTP or HTTPS, it's not really any different than, than any other pod. It's when you're doing something like RDP or SSH, that requires a little bit more uh, planning. So to that end, I'm gonna go over to my BERT demo project. Oh, if I get out of my Fedora virtual machine first. Minor detail. Minor detail. Yeah. There we go. So now I'm using that. So OC get BMI. There's my Windows 2019. Uh, virtual machine I have running. I'm going to do, I'm going to use that BERT cuddle uh, command I was talking about. Again, this is a binary that's available. Um, I want to say it's on the uh, kubert uh, GitHub, if I'm remembering correctly, but uh, within RHEL, we do have it expo uh, um, in a repository that you can download it from. But again, for Windows or Mac, you're not going to be using a repository, so you can just grab that from, uh, from GitHub. So I'm going to do expose. BMI, um, win 2019, mm. name is going to be win 2019 RDP. For my port, I'm going to do the default RDP port, which is 3389. Oh, boy. And then target port. I don't need to do the uh, target port, but I do need to do... Node port, or yeah, right, right yeah. type is node port. Okay, so so yeah, I'm gonna drop the uh, the blog post about yeah. the GA today in gotcha. the chat for everybody. Cool, cool. So. Down here. So where's my node port, node port, node port. I might have told you the wrong thing too. I could no, have. you definitely. <laughs> I've done this before. I know you have. It's just not. Uh, not your day. It's not. okay though. You know what? It's, not. it's okay to have, not have a great day on this channel. It's totally fine. Type equals node port. What the heck am I doing wrong here? Order. Is the order right? Does the order matter? Shouldn't matter. Port. Hmm. All right. All those fails up error to when it worked right, right? There you go. Capitalized. That's ah. Uh, I should have known uh, that. God, I should have known case, that. Damn it. There we go. <laughs> Open shift commands are case sensitive. Some of them are. Uh, uh, so that goes all the way down to the core Kubernetes, man. I should have known that. Uh, 
And you know, it's, I should have done it. I should have known too, but yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Like you said, it's, it's been a long day. Yeah. I mean, I've been so. up since five, so <laughs> I've been going at it hardcore with KubeCon. I know so. you got KubeCon. I just, I just got kids to keep me up all night. Yeah. Well, so, that so now, sometimes. yeah, I know that's always fun. Isn't it? Yeah. So, so now I've got this windows 2019 RDP port. So that's exposing uh RDP on that, that port. Um, if I go back over to my virtual machine, So Windows 2019, so if I hit the console here, there is my Windows console, the lovely default lock screen. I'm gonna hit my drop down here. And again, I've got that same serial console option, but I've also got desktop viewer, which now brings up a little lovely window to say, hey, do you wanna launch the remote desktop client? This is another part of why I did this through Windows because I wanted to save myself the pain of trying to access RDP through a non-Microsoft uh, terminal services client. Sure. So you can see it's going to come up. It's going to ask me for the password to log in as administrator. I could change who I'm logging in as if I want. And you can see it's going to cert, bring up that little, yeah, that friendly little yeah. dialog box saying, hey, this is a self-signed cert with this Windows host name. Are you sure you want to do this? And I can say, don't ask me. I can hit yes. Um, I could go in and make some changes to that RDP file as well if I want. So just go ahead and hit configure here and We'll let it go through. It's it's um actually going to take a little bit because it's going through a couple different layers of natting. But uh, while we're waiting for that, let's see what else did I want to show. Oh yeah, I wanted to hit Tower Ansible Tower before we uh before we wrapped up. Yeah. So you can see if I go over to my Tower project. Actually, I've already got it running in a tab here. No, oh, sweet. See, I tell you, sometimes I do think ahead and I actually do keep certain tabs open. <laughs> so um, this is Ansible Tower running in OpenShift, which is, it works, it's supported if that's the way you want to go. Um, again, if not, you can always do a jump post or whatever to get in. Mm -hmm. I do have a manually defined inventory that consists only of that Fedora virtual machine I was running. Okay. So you can see him right there. He's using the pod uh, networking IP. Um, and since Tower is running as a pod, it can talk to it on that without any any special precautions. So I can actually run in here mm -hmm. and I can do a basic ad hoc command. I'm just gonna do this poor yeah. thing. So we're just gonna go ahead and do just a simple ping just to validate that it's okay. up. I'm gonna supply a credential to it. I've got my, uh, my private key baked in here. So I can just go ahead and run that, hit launch. And it'll go through and it'll establish its connection. It's going to give me a warning that about uh, Python being a, the not the right version for Fedora, basically. But that doesn't really amount to anything for what we're doing. It's just establishing the communication. Come on, Ansible, do your thing. Hmm. So it's Tower running on OpenShift, going across the OpenShift network to the vert. OK. Right. And there, there we, we go. go. So we got our okay. response back. So that works. Um, so yeah, that's that's how you would do like day two operations. You can do uh, you know you can do your full job templates against it. So if I want to secure my SSH, I can just go ahead and run that. And you can see it's going to talk to that same demo inventory, uh, utilizing the same uh, credential. Nice. I mean, this is OpenShift Tower or. Oh. OpenShift Tower, Ansible Tower that I know and love. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So you can see it's gathering its facts now. Um, we'll be able to access those if we want. So again, the facts are going to be something Ansible is going to gather, just intel about the virtual machine and the environment that it's running in. So uh, yeah. And it's, it's it's all on OpenShift. It's all on OpenShift. Or, you know, you could have your tower instance outside and do stuff with that and exactly. jump into OpenShift. However you want to mix this cocktail, you can. Yep. <laughs> So this is going to go through some of the, and some of this stuff has probably already been done, like disabling password login. I'm going to set like an SSH banner, nice. um, a couple things like that. Cool. So yeah, disable password login was already done. So no changes there. Write the basic issue.net file and um, so on and so on. So with that, we're at the top of the hour here. I've hit just about everything I wanted to show other than uh, the network policies, but take my word for it. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, if, if I've got, 
a few more minutes if you want. Well, if, you right, got, can, if you got time, I'll go yeah, I've it. got. I can give you 15, right? Okay. Like, yeah. Cool. So let's SSH back into my Fedora VM here. If we time it right, nah, unfortunately, we didn't get to, to where that uh, SSH banner was set. There you go. There, it's, it's added now. I'm sorry. I just got to get out and do it again. I want to see my banner, make sure it worked. I like you. <laughs> Let's log in. Hmm, it didn't give it to me. Oh, because this is interesting. Oh, it just All right. did. Yeah. All right. I'll let it go. Yeah. I'll, I will cap Etsy MOD, MODT just to val validate that it's there. Hmm. Oh. Oh, it's writing it right now. Oh, well, there you go. Well, where's the issue.net file? You can find well, that. Let's look at that. Yeah. There we go. Authorized users via public key only. No plain text passwords. Yeah. So that's that's what my uh, my tower job was doing. You can see it uh, says we're right here. So we know that worked at least. All right. So um, one thing to point out about the the networking in, in OpenShift: the the pod network IP address you see is not the actual address on the virtual machine itself. They all have this 10.0.2.2 address, right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, since we're using software-defined networking, it doesn't matter what the actual um, IP address of the virtual machine is. Um, the pod networking is translating everything back and forth between the, the different interfaces. So to things running in the, the podified environment, they're going to talk to it on uh, that, that pod IP address we saw. Right. So again, I'm going to go back out here. I'm going to drop into that uh, zero S uh, virtual machine I created earlier. Let's get a virtualization. Oh wait, that's right. I put it under default because I was stupid. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot to, to change. Got to change spaces. projects. Yeah, no, do it all the time. It's fine. Yeah. So I'm going to log into zero S or zeros. I never know what to call it. Uh, yeah, cloud thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. So again. IPA, it's got the same address. Now, huh. let me log back out here and we'll do OC get BMI, all namespaces again, just because I want to see all of their um, addresses. So you can see it's showing their namespace and what their IP address is, right? Right. So. Let's look at the Fedora. He's 10, 128, 4.38. Okay. So if I ping that guy, I'm getting a response. Nice. Again, to validate that there's no uh, craziness going on here, I'm going to curl that guy on that same address. And you'll see that same index yeah. HTML we edited earlier, right? Nice. Good stuff. Now, what if I don't want that to happen, though? What if I want to be able to? Um, yeah, I don't want stuff in my default project to be able to talk yeah, right. about anything, right? Like, right. Yeah. Nobody wants that. So no. I'm going to do a deny all. Oh, oh, snap. So now, that's right. I need to apply this to the default namespace. Ha ha. OC project. Oh, you know, yeah. That'll yeah. probably break stuff. That'll, I don't think I want to do that. Yeah. You, you, yeah. Be careful with that. One. But I do want to go to. <laughs> All right. So I'm on the vert, the vert demo two. And now. Huh. Huh. Let's go look at our network policies. What? Why did that not apply? Uh, hmm. Let me just cap that to make sure I didn't have any. Uh... Oh, come on. D. Hmm. Oh. All right. Well, let's do this the hard way. Okay. So, or easy way, maybe. Easy way? Copy pasta. Copy paste. Create network policy. Let's dump all this stuff out of here. Paste that in. Okay. 
Now, not sure we go back over hmm. to our virtual machines. Let's just do all projects so I can see them all at once. Cool. Let's go back to my zero OS guy. And now, let's see. And now I don't have any pings going in. Nice. I can't curl it. So that's what I'd expect. All traffic is stopped. Good now, job. maybe I do want to allow some traffic in there. Like, you know, that's a web server. Right. I want to be able to access right. the web on it, right? So this is just a matter of going in. We'll go ahead and dump this guy. And we'll create a new policy. So again, you can see this is going to allow, this is going to apply to all pods in this project. And again, I could get granular. I could do like tagging there, mm -hmm. um, labeling based type uh, access. But the, the main rule here is it's going to allow traffic in on port 80 TCP, which of course is a your typical web services port. Oh, there's our RDP window, by the way. Woohoo. <laughs> so uh, going back over here, now, uh, we're going back over to our virtual machine console in Zero S, rather. Mm -hmm. Come on, Zero S. So now again, I can curl it. Hey, look at that. But I still can't ping it. Nice. So that's just a quick intro for how you can secure your workloads on container native virtualization when they're using that uh, native pod networking. Um, and again, it's insanely, insanely, insanely granular, uh, the stuff you can do using uh, network policies in OpenShift. Yeah. Now you can get down to, like, I want this label to only be able to transfer you know, <laughs> X amount of right. data per day kind of thing. I think if you really wanted to meter it out and everything else, you probably could string all that together, but yep. goodness. I mean, you know, like I think there's, there's plenty of policy, you know, like examples out there for folks to use and copy, right? Like you don't have to, you don't have to do that on your own. Go look for right. some, right? Like there's plenty of valid stuff out there that's worthwhile and using, right? Like you can read YAML. Um, yep. just like everybody else can. So just validate that it's good for you and your workloads and off you go. Yep. And I'll say the docs actually have a good section on network policies. And mm -hmm. then, uh, there's also some stuff up on, uh, uh, the open shift, uh, consulting GitHub, the red hat consulting, uh, stuff, some of the things they've done for other customers. So yeah, lots of good examples to get started. Cool. Awesome. Jason, thank you very much for everything today. Yep. Now, I think that's all I wanted to show today. Um, you know, I, I just want to point out I'm wearing my containers or Linux shirt. <laughs> and I've literally done them to that. So are VMs now. So ah, nice. <laughs> I'll see if I'll see if Paul can get me one officially printed up like that. Paul, just like that, that, like with the with the sideways posted note, that'd be great. I would love <laughs> that. Would that. that would be yes. amazing. Awesome. Yeah. So thanks, Peter, Chris, Peter Lauerbach, if you're listening still, please, we need that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I had a good time today. This was fun. Uh, thanks awesome, for having Jason. me. And uh, yeah, public yeah. sector customers, if you're interested in OpenShift virtualization, talk to your reps, have them ask for me. And uh, I hope you figure out if your workloads are a good fit. Yeah, and definitely come back uh, next week for, uh, oh, come on calendar. Uh, it's just one of those days. How to build and scale applications with confidence using Microsoft Azure Red Hat OpenShift. That'll be cool, right? Definitely. Yeah. That'll be awesome. That's actually from, who was that with? Uh, I'm going to be joined by uh, Phil Cramp. Uh, oh, yeah, he's Peter a good Cramp. person. Peter Cramp. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah, your demo was awesome today, though. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, OpenShift Virtualizations GA Today, that blog post again. Uh, if, if you missed it, I'll drop it again. And um, when in doubt check the uh, live streaming calendar, which I just dropped the link to again, and you too can join us and subscribe and follow us on Twitch, Facebook, or YouTube, wherever you think is best for you to catch our live videos. And we'll see you again out there in the streaming universe very soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.